Um, our next speaker is Kevin Boyle, who's a professor of history at Ohio State University. Kevin. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. I don't know, really know what it means that Bob and I are both native Detroiters. I don't know if there's some sort of <laughs> deep symbolism to that. Um, as Keith said, I teach history at Ohio State. And one of the things you really don't want to do when you have a retrospective on a book is invite a historian to come. <laughs> because they're going to do one of two things. One thing they are going to do, one tendency they have, and it's the lesser one, is they're going to say all the things about the book that made the book a classic. And they're going to talk about the craft of the book, and they're going to talk about the art of the book, and they're going to make it utterly lifeless. The other thing they're going to do, which is way more likely, is what they're going to do is they're going to tell you all the things that the author should have said and didn't because it turned out that the author wasn't as bright as the historian. <laughs> and when they do that, they're going to do that in order to make themselves feel better that they will never write a classic book. <laughs> so let me do those two things. <laughs> There are a lot of reasons that The Other America is a classic book. But one of the things I think that makes it such an impressive achievement is the sheer craft of it. If you haven't read it in a while, one of the beauties of the book is that what Harrington does is he starts almost every chapter with a very intimate glimpse of poverty, of the slave market down in what is now ironically enough Tribeca, or of the elderly man living in a flop house. And once he's got that for you, once you've got that personal touch, then he pulls it out into a broad analysis that's rooted in the kind of statistics you just gave us. And it's all done in this extraordinarily matter-of-fact tone. The moral outrage is always below the surface of the book, so that the book's never scalding to touch. And then there are a couple things that he left out doesn't really talk about women and children. Though, in fact, in the 1960s as today, women and children often bear the brunt of poverty. He does talk just a little too much about the culture of poverty, which in different hands can be a way to batter the poor. And he very much hides his socialism, which is one of the reasons when you get to the end of the book, the policy prescriptions are actually really very, very thin. There, I've done my historian part. <laughs> but the more I thought about coming here tonight and talking about the book, the thing that kept coming back to me, really the power of this book, the thing that makes this book really so important, isn't that it's a classic, but that it's so relevant. And that's also the very frightening thing about this book. And I want to focus this for a couple minutes on I, what I think is really the key relevance of this book, and it comes at the very end of the book. Because what, and this fits perfectly with what you were just saying, you love that. You're always happy when the person ahead of you, it fits with what you want to say, it doesn't contradict it, because that's really awful when that happens. <laughs> what he says is that private interests, corporate America, is not going to solve the problem of poverty, because if it was going to do that, it would have done that by now. And state and local governments, no matter how well-intentioned, can't solve the problem of poverty because they don't have the resources to solve the problem of poverty. And so the problem must be solved by the federal government. And then what he says is that, but the federal government's never going to do that until there is a fundamental realignment of the two major political parties, until the two major political parties become ideologically coherent, which was a basic standard argument that was dominant in the democratic left of the late 50s and early 1960s. What he didn't realize, he couldn't realize, is that that realignment took place two years after this book was published. And it took place because of the Civil Rights Revolution. That because of the Civil Rights Revolution in the South, in 1964, the White South left the Democratic Party and became a key component of the Republican Party. I was just teaching this in a class down at Ohio State yesterday. I showed them the map. Look at the map of the 1964 presidential election. Barry Goldwater, 
carried one state, his own, outside of the Deep South. Everything else he carried in the Deep South. It never happened for a Republican before. It has every time since, almost every time since. And for a while, at least, what also happened was that the center of American politics shifted to the left. And that's where the war on poverty and the great society came from. That because of that fundamental realignment, just as Michael Harrington said, there was a whole wave of reforms that accomplished the most extraordinary things. Let me give you some statistics. In 1962, I just looked these up, so these must be accurate. Got them on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just made that up. 1962, 21% of Americans and about 50% of African Americans lived below the poverty line. A decade later, 1973 to be exact, 11.1% of Americans lived below the poverty line, while the African American percentage was down to 31%. That's 11 years, 1962 to 1973, where the poverty rate absolutely fell. Ronald Reagan loved to say, it's one of his favorite lines, we fought a war against poverty and poverty won. That's not even close to true. The federal government fought a war against poverty, and poverty went into massive retreat. And then, and it sits so perfectly with your slides up here, then right around the mid-70s, right around where those lines started to diverge, the center of American politics, for a whole variety of reasons, and I have 10 minutes, so I'm not going to give you any of them, but anyways, <laughs> you all know them anyways, shifted to the right. And the Republican Party built a conservative coalition whose main purpose was to, as they would put it, empower free enterprise mm -hmm. and undercut, that's the polite way of putting it, eviscerate, might be a better term, the welfare state. It was a political agenda. Or a better way of putting it is, it is a political agenda. Mm -hmm. And the result of that was the reversal of so much of what was accomplished in those 10 years. And the numbers are absolutely clear. 2011, the last year for which statistics are available, 15% of Americans lived below the poverty line. That's the highest percentage since 1993. And 1993 was an anomalous year. In fact, to find a comparable couple of years since the last, that are compared to the last couple we have, you have to actually go back to 1982-83, the Great Reagan Recession, which was devastating. And you saw that in the unemployment statistics. Unemployment was higher the Great Depression in that Reagan recession than it, was, than it is now. African American poverty in 2011, 27.6% of African Americans live in poverty. That's the worst rate for African Americans in a decade and a half. This is the most startling statistic of them all. In 2011, 48% of the American people, that's 97.3 million Americans, live within 200% of the poverty line. Half of all Americans live in what is essentially, what we essentially describe as the near poor. Half, that's that, it's actually more than the 47%. It's the 48%. And the percent, as you already pointed out, the percent of those living at half the poverty rate, which is about 6.2, 6.3%, that's the highest rate, half the poverty level, since that statistic has been kept in 2011. And that's what's so haunting about this book. 50 years ago, this is the kind of thing historians, I get paid to say stuff like this. Well, not tonight. 50 years ago is a long time. When Michael Harrington was sitting in his flat in New York City writing this book, I can almost guarantee you, he did not read Jacob Reese's How the Other Half Lived and said, oh, this is the way it is today. But we can read Michael Harrington and say, this is the way it is today. So just for a second, let me do that. And this is his conclusion. The other America cannot be abolished, he said, through concessions and compromises that are inevitably made at the expense of the poor. The spirit, the vision that are required if the nation is to penetrate the wall of pessimism and despair that surrounds the impoverished millions cannot be produced under such circumstances. What is needed if poverty is to be abolished is a return to political debate, 
a restructuring of the party system so there can be clear choices, a new mood of social idealism. That's America today. That's what people dream about, is to have a genuine political debate to have a political discussion, an honest, open political discussion, not to agree, but to have an honest, open political discussion about the questions of equality and inequality. To imagine that somehow the power of grassroots politics can penetrate upward into what is an incredibly benighted Washington, D.C. And to actually imagine a day, maybe 50 years from now, when the other America actually is the museum piece that Michael Harrington would have wanted it to be. Thanks very much for inviting me. Thank you.